take your Bible this morning, if you would, please, and go to the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 24, please. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 24. Two verses to read together this morning, verses 14 and 15. Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. Since just two verses, we'll read them in unison together this morning. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read God's Word. <clears throat> All of us standing, and we'll read verses 14 and 15 together of Joshua chapter 24. Ready? Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture. Uh, here this morning. Father, I'm asking you that you would continue to prepare our hearts, make them ready to receive the truth that you have for us today. Thank you for the wonderful music this morning. Thank you, God, for the good spirit that's in this place. And Father, I'm asking you now that you'll bless the special, that it will continue to put our hearts in tune with your heart, that we'll all have ears to hear what the spirit would say to us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. When I think of how he came so far from glory I may never 
cross he'd go for who am I? Father, we thank you now for this morning, and Lord, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you, Father, for so loving the world that you gave your only begotten Son. Lord, surely we're we're grateful for the grace of God that brings salvation. Lord, undeserved favor on your behalf because who are we? We're sinners that have been saved by grace. Now, Father, I pray you'll help us this morning as we open up uh, to this particular Old Testament passage. And as we focus on our family today, our earthly family, uh, those who uh, we would call brother, sister, mom, dad, those of us who uh, are joined by a blood relation, I pray, God, that you would help us to understand the truth you have for us from your word. Lord, we desire to have lives that please you. We desire to have families that please you and that are right in your sight. And so give us understanding today and give us help from your word as only you can. And I'll thank you for what you'll do. I pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The, there's an old country music song I, I want to understand, and I, I, I don't listen to country music, but this is, I uh, understand a fellow sang a song called Choices. And the main line of the song said this, I'm living and dying with the choices I made. I'm living and dying with the choices I've made. That's so true. I, I, I read that and I, Brother Don, I thought about your nephew. Is it your nephew in Florida with the cancer? And the, what you said Friday night as he knew that he's having to live with choices that he's made. And we all do. We all live and die by the choices we make in our lives. There's some major choices that everybody makes in life. You'll, you'll have to make a choice. What kind of work will I do? Talk to, you begin to talk to young people who are juniors or seniors in high school, and the question is always, what do you want to do with your life? I always like to ask him, what do you think God wants you to do with your life? It's not a matter of what I want to do. What does God want me to do? Have you prayed and asked God to make His will known to you? That you would know what God wants you to do? How will you use the gifts and the talents or the abilities God's given you to make a difference in the world or make a difference in His church? Make a difference in your community. Another big decision is not just the work I'll do, but who will I marry? Who will I marry? Maybe, maybe or maybe it's better... Who would want to marry me? <laughs> I don't know. That's a, maybe that's a better question. But you know, a lot of times, by the way, too little thought is given to that. We're not, well, too often, we're not guided by thought in that area. We're guided by emotions. And, and we make emotional mistakes and emotional decisions. But you know, who you choose to spend your life with on earth is a major decision. And some of you understand that. You shake your head on that. Who you, who you choose to marry is a life-changing decision. Where will I live? Another decision you have to make. Where are we going to live? We talked about Florida or Ohio, you know. And, and, and by the way, not everybody wants to live in Florida. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, Sally uh, Spargrove is back in, I think, Illinois and uh, she didn't like Florida. You know why? It was hot all the time. See, you know, you get used to, sometimes people like the seasons. You know, that's why, by the way, that's the climate change I believe in. <laughs> Summer, fall, winter, and spring, okay? That's climate change right there. But, but where will I live? You know, in uh, this August, uh, my wife and I will celebrate 38 years of marriage. I married her when she was 12, but, um, <laughs> and I added it up this week, we've, 
in 38 years, we've served in five different churches. We have lived in eight different states, eight different cities, and 17 different houses in our 38 years of being married. And uh, I, I read that and I thought, man, I'm tired. But um, and I hate moving. Don't you hate moving? But you know, each, each time there's a move, there's much time of prayer and consideration because we know, uh, especially in the younger years, that move doesn't just affect us, it affects our children too. It affects people, uh, other people in your life as well. So, what kind of work will I do? Who will I marry? Where will I live? All these decisions are big decisions. But there's another big decision, and that's the decision Joshua gives us in Joshua 24. Now, Israel has possessed the promised land. That's what Joshua is all about. They go in, you conquer Jericho, you have the mess up at Ai, and then they regroup, and then they just march on in, and they take the land that God's promised to them. They've divided it up to the tribes. They now are possessing the land. Joshua's 110 years old. He's ready to die. And before he dies, he wants to make sure they understand something. He wants to make sure you're in a new land now. You're in the land where God promised you. You're in the place that God wants you to be. And now I have a challenge for you. In fact, I have a question for you. And Joshua tells him in verse 15 of Joshua 24, he says, the last part of the verse, he says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua says we've made a decision to serve the Lord. I don't know what you're going to do. He said, now your father served other gods. And, and you're, they served gods on the other side of the flood or back in Egypt. But he says, I want you to know something. As for me and my house, I've made a decision. And my decision is, we are going to serve the Lord. And I would tell you this morning, the one, along with what kind of work am I going to do, who am I going to marry, where am I going to live, uh, listen, one of the greatest decisions you ever make in your life is when you make the decision, I will serve God with my life. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's going to be a huge decision in your life. Because that decision is going to determine the course of your life. It's going to determine the direction of your life. It's going to determine whether you're going to live your life doing the will of God, in the will of God, or outside of the will of God. Joshua says you're going to live in a land where there's false gods. And are you going to serve the gods of the Amorites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and all the ites that you read about as they come in to conquer the land. They were supposed to utterly drive all them out. They didn't. They let some in the land. Consequently, the opportunity to go after their gods was, was there and it was real. And Joshua knew that. He said, so you're going to have to make a choice. And can I tell you today, there's other gods whom you can serve. There are other gods who you serve. Listen, that, why do you think God said way back in the book of Exodus, thou shalt have no other gods before me. He wouldn't have to say that if he didn't know there'd be a struggle for us to put other gods before him. He's to be supreme. He's to be first place, as we mentioned in Sunday school this morning. And so he says there's going to be a decision you have to make. If you don't make a decision, you're making a decision. If you don't say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, you're making the decision to serve other gods. There's no middle ground. There's no neutrality. There's no riding the fence. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Joshua is saying you've got to choose whose side you're on. You cannot ride the fence you can't wear the, the coat of the north and the pants of the south. You're both sides will shoot at you. You don't get anywhere that way. You have to make your decision. And Joshua says, while you're trying to decide what you're going to do, I want you to know, as for me and my house, 
we will serve the Lord. Your decision is going to affect your politics. Your decision is going to affect your job. Your decision is going to affect your clothing. Your decision is going to affect your speech. Your decision is going to affect your attitudes. Your decision is going to affect your choice of television and movies. Your decision is going to affect the music you listen to. Your decision is going to affect uh, the way you spend your money. Your decision is going to affect the way you spend your Sundays. Your decision is going to affect where you shop. Your decision will affect what magazines you're going to subscribe to. In other words, your decision is going to affect every area of your life. I'd like you to make the decision today that Joshua made. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now what does that mean? If I make that decision, what will that look like? Well, I think it will look like this. Number one, it will look like the man will be the leader in the home. The man will be the leader in the home. Did you notice who made the announcement about serving God? It wasn't Mrs. Joshua. It was Joshua. He said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He, Joshua wasn't one of those fellows who said, well, my wife takes care of the religious things in the family. My wife does all the spiritual stuff. My wife's the one who goes to church. No, 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 no. God said, uh, Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua says, I'll take the lead in this thing. And I will serve the Lord. Did you know that the home is the oldest institution on earth? Uh, it's, it, it's older than the church. God established, the first thing established in the Garden of Eden was a home with a husband and wife and Adam and Eve. And so the, the church is no stronger than their families. And the families are no stronger than its fathers. We need men again in our homes. We need men again to lead our country. And by the way, I'll just put a parenthesis in here. You, you, you like it, don't like it. You just uh, you, you swallow it any way you can, all right? But uh, one of the problems we got is we have some leadership in our country. And folks don't like it. Whether you like what's being done or don't like what's being done, we have somebody in there who's getting something done. And we haven't had that for so long. We have a, we have, I'll come to this later, but we got a lot of spoiled brats who are having a hard time with authority and with leadership and they're stomping their feet and that includes politicians and that includes the news media and and they're upset because finally we have a leader like it or don't like it it's leadership we need men again to lead and men again to lead in the home men of conviction men of character men of prayer Men who are the head. You know what the head does? The head sets the direction. You know what your head does on your body? It sets the direction. I would mentioned that in Sunday school because Christ being the head of the church sets the direction for the church. But if you don't, if you don't want to follow the direction of your head, try, try looking this way and walking this way. I'm headed for trouble, aren't I? Huh? You ever look one way? Or you see people all the time. You see it? They're walking and they're walking and they're doing this. Hmm? And buddy, you run in, cars have to stop, people have to get out of your way. Because you're not paying any attention. You're not, you're, you're, your head sets the direction. And so men, what do you do in the home? You set the direction for your home. And then the, the folks in the home follow. Look at Genesis 19 with me, will you please? Genesis 19 is where God has said He's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Go to Genesis 18. Go back one more chapter to Genesis 18, will you please? It's verse 19 that I'm looking for. No, here's what's happening. Look at me. God is saying, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, but I can't hide from Abraham what I'm about to do. I need to tell Abraham. And so he tells Abraham he's going to destroy it. And Abraham goes to prayer, goes to talk to God. And he says, God, if there's 
50 righteous people. Will you spare the city for 50 righteous? And God said, if there's 50 righteous, I'll spare it. And he works on down to where finally he got the 10 righteous people. And he said, if there's just 10 righteous people, I'll spare the city. I believe personally he was praying for Lot and his family. I think Lot, we know, had two daughters and his wife that got out. That's four of them. And I think he had others. They said he went to his sons-in-law. So he might have had three, I think, three other daughters who were married. That's six and four is ten. I think if he figured if Lot just got his family, then, then, then we could save, the, save them anyway. But he's praying. But notice why God said he wouldn't hide from Abraham what he was about to do. Listen to what he said in chapter 18, verse 19. God says, for I know him. God is saying, I know Abraham. What do I know about Abraham? That he will command his children and his household after me? No. After him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham the thing which he has spoken of him. He says, hey, I'm not going to hide from Abraham because I know he's going to command, notice, his children and his household after him. Abraham's going to be the leader. And as the leader, he doesn't say, hey, do as I say, not as I do. Comes a time when, when listen, you've got to lead by example. And you have to lead the way. He said, follow. He's saying what Paul told the people in the New Testament. He said, you follow me as I follow Christ. You follow me as I follow Christ. He's going to command his children to follow him. Men, lead your home in reading the Bible. Men, lead your home in a time of prayer. Men, lead your home when it comes to coming to church and being in the house of God. Men, be the leader in your home. Lead your home in serving Christ. Don't you come and occupy, I was going to say 18 inches, maybe it's a little bit more, uh, so many inches on a chair, and just warm the seat while your wife serves God. You serve God. You lead the way. You are the leader in the home. You're the head of your home. And so, what will... Serving the Lord mean? It means you're going to be the leader at home. Number two, it means you're going to show the role of Christ to your family. The Bible says, Ephesians chapter 5. Would you go over there to the New Testament? Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 is where the Bible deals extensively with the husband and wife relationship. And in Ephesians 5 and verse 23... The Bible says, for the husband is the head of the wife. That's where we get the idea, is man the head of the home? Yes, because God said so. Okay? Now, notice what he said. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. So he's the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. So the man represents Christ. The woman represents the church, the believer. Not just on Sundays, not just on special occasions, but 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's always the case. Now, if the wife isn't behaving like the church, does that mean I don't have to behave like Christ? Absolutely not. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Christ is the same to the just and the unjust. So if there's a falling out between the husband and the wife, the husband, Christ, is to seek the reconciliation. The husband, Christ, is to seek to initiate 
making things right. The, you should initiate the making up that may, be, that may lead to making out. I don't know. <laughs> but you're to be the one that initiates that. You show the role of Christ to your wife. Did the church seek Christ? Or did Christ seek the church? Christ is the seeker. And you're to be the seeker, man. Show the role of Christ to your wife. You show the role of God to your children. You show the role of God to your children. When Jesus taught His disciples to pray, the, the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer, as some call it, He said, after this manner pray ye, first two words, Our Father, Our Father, which art in heaven. The nearest thing children have to knowing God is their father. You will shape what they think God is. A bus pastor was at the church on a Saturday and some boys were playing across the street. He called them over and he offered to pay him a dollar to sweep out the bus. And the boy said, can my friend help me? He said, sure he can. And after they were done, he asked where they lived, and he said, we're just down the street here a little bit. And he said, well, what's your name? He said, my name's Meeks. And the boy said, and, and the man said, Meeks. I used to work with a guy named Meeks. What's your dad's name? And the boy kind of dropped his head, and he said, my dad was killed last July in an accident. And the bus pastor said, I'm so sorry, but what did you say his first name was? He said, well, some folks called him Raymond. My mama, she just called him Sweet Thing. But we, we just called him Daddy. We just called him Daddy. Look at me, fellas. If you have somebody at home that just calls you Daddy, you have a big responsibility. You have a huge responsibility upon your shoulders to show them what a father is supposed to be like. Years ago, I was talking to somebody and they were doing inner city work and he was saying how when he goes in to do inner city work, he never refers to God as father because so many of those children have been hurt and abused and done wrong by fathers. They have such a bad connotation of what that word is. You see, they've, they've made it very difficult for them to accept the fact God is a good father. He's a loving father. He, he does good things for you. It's hard for them to compute that because of their experience with a bad role model as an earthly father. But God is a loving father. You have a great responsibility. Show your children. Listen, let your children know that they can please you. Or they'll feel like they can never please God. Let them know they can please you. Don't, don't ever, don't always, and every time they do something, say, well, that's pretty good, but you should have done this. Well, that's not too bad, but you should have done it this way. Or here, let me do this. No, no, no. Just learn to let them know they can please you. How many children I've heard through the years that say, it's no, nothing's ever good enough for my mom and dad. Nothing's ever good enough for them. And they feel like they can never please them. Show them. Show them they can trust you. You know why? They'll be able to trust God. Show them that you keep your word. Why? They'll know God keeps His word. You're the role model for God to your children. And their early ideas about God and who God is is going to be shaped through who you are. Because they call you daddy. So you show the role of Christ to the wife and God to the children. If you're going to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, then that means parents set the moral example. It means parents set the moral example. The Bible says it this way in Ephesians chapter 6, that you're to bring the children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And that means, as I said earlier, if 
If, you, if you're trying to bring your children up by telling them, do as I say, not as I do, you're wasting your breath. If you don't want them to partake in alcohol, you better not drink. If you don't want them to partake in tobacco, you better not smoke. How good do you think it does to tell your kid now, now, don't you ever do this. Don't you ever pick up these things. They will. They will. You never get what you say, you get what you are. Boy, that's quiet. You teach them so much more by what you are than by what you say. You set the example in your language. You set the example in what you view on television. You set the example in love and forgiveness and compassion, giving and kindness. Much, much more is caught than is taught when it comes to your children. On February 19, 1979, a small plane crashed into Ontario Peak in the San Gabriel Mountains. And a 10-hour story of death, courage, and survival began. The passengers of the Cessna 172 included a pilot, a young woman, an attorney, and his 11-year-old son. The pilot and the attorney were killed in the crash. The boy said he knew his father was dead when he tried to rouse him and he wouldn't wake up. The boy and the young woman huddled in the snow near the plane for seven hours hoping to get rescued. Finally, they decided they have to attempt the treacherous descent down the mountain or they'll freeze to death. Shortly after they started, the woman fell 350 feet to her death. The boy, all 75 pounds of him, was lost and all alone on that mountain in the freezing cold. Bloody, bruised, broken bones in both hands, his father dead laying a few feet away. What was he going to do? He never gave up. He began to slide down the mountain on the seat of his pants clutching a stick in his fractured hands. Whenever he began to get going too fast, he'd wedge the stick in the snow as a break. About 5 p.m. that night, he was found near a village at the foot of the mountain and rushed to a hospital. Wet, bloody, and exhausted, but very much alive. Before his release from the hospital, there was a news conference and of course, he had all kinds of questions that were coming his way. How did he find the courage to go on? Did he ever feel like quitting? And finally, he said this. He said, listen, I'm alive today because of what my dad taught me. And they said, what did your, what did your dad teach you? He said, my dad taught me to never give up. Never give up. Don't think that what you teach your children or what you model for your children doesn't impact their life. It does. At the funeral of a man, different ones were giving their comments or their eulogies, whatever you want to call them. And the son of the man got up and he talked about, he recalls a day when he was just 11 years old and his dad took him fishing. He said, and he went on about that day and how they spent all day on the boat fishing and how great it was and how much he enjoyed it. And, and just, that was one of the most vivid memories he had of his childhood. And later they went back into dad's diary. And they looked up that day that the boy talked about where they went fishing. And dad put in his diary, went fishing all day with, and he named his son's name. And he put underneath that, a day wasted. A day wasted. Dad's, mom's, 
a day you spend with your children is never a wasted day. Is never a wasted day. And I'll tell you, I, I know you're young and maybe your children are young and you got... It's it's chaotic sometimes at your house, and uh, you you say, "Man, I can't wait till these kids get grown." Uh, there are people in this room who tell you how fast that goes, and there are people in this room who would say, "You know what? I, I'd love to have just one day like that. If I could just come back, just have one day with those kids again, and 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 make it count. Don't don't you, you set the moral example for your children. The question you ask yourself is. What are my children learning from me? What are my children learning from me? Number four, if you say, for me and my house will serve the Lord, that means your children will be disciplined. The Bible says in Proverbs 22.6, you're familiar with the verse, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from him. Train them up. Work with them, instruct them, develop them, correct them, shape them. But I don't know what's what's happened to our generation. I I know what's happened. I'm going to ask you a question. Those of you in this room who are, uh, how many of you in this room are over 30 years of age? Let me see your hand. Okay, most, most people. How many of you over 30 years of age, your mother and dad disciplined you, and I mean... If you disobeyed and you talked back, you got, you got a whipping, you got a spanking, you got your mouth washed out with soap, you got, but they disciplined you. How many of you had happened to? I think about everybody's hand goes back up. And look how ruined you were. Huh? What is it that then has caused those of us and the younger generation even who were brought up that way not to do that to their children. Mom and dad, let me, let me help you help me understand something. Training is always going on in your home. Either you are training the children or the children are training you. Children ought to be taught that when you say stop, they stop. Children ought to be taught when you say, come here. It's not cute when they're just toddling and you say, come here, and they turn and run the other way and giggle. That's not funny. That's disobedience. And this this idea of, okay, one, two. What is that? You know what it is? They're training you to count to three. what they're doing I parents discipline your children they need to respect your authority not not saying hey, listen that isn't being mean it isn't being helpful the Bible says if you love your child you'll discipline them God says in Hebrews 12 that every son whom he receives he chastens you know what that means? He disciplines every one of us. Why? Because he loves us. My dad never disciplined the neighbor kids. Not that he didn't care about them, but he didn't love them like he loved me. And I'm, as a kid, I wish he would have loved them like he loved me. But I understand that. But, I, but I, listen, I'm thankful for every time that he disciplined me when I was young. I needed it. And there, were, there was enough times you say, oh, I got spanked when I didn't deserve it. Yeah, think of all those times you didn't and you should have. They'd have just known. You know, we got a problem in this country. We got a problem, a bunch of spoiled brat kids that have grown up getting whatever they wanted are getting, getting their own way and, and now they, they, things don't go their way in life and they want to go break windows and start fires and, and, and cause all kinds of problems. They're just spoiled, rotten, little brats. I'd like to, you just need to line them up and, and put some old grandpas and grandpas out there and bend them over the knee with a paddle and give them all a good whooping. 
They, they, they're not disciplined. You know what? You have to understand, hey, sometimes, don't, well, it's not fair. Get, get used to it. Life's not fair. Get used to it. Well, well, they got one and I didn't get one. That's the way it works sometimes. They, they win. They get the trophy. You lose. You don't get anything. Save me from participation trophies. Help us. Teach your children that anything less than immediate obedience is disobedience. Anything less than immediate obedience is disobedience. They don't, never, don't let your children throw tantrums. Learn, learn these words. Do you want to cry? I will give you something to cry about. Some of you are smiling. You've heard those words. You've experienced that. And again, I'm not, I'm not and, and one of the things you do when you discipline your children, and, and I've taught on this before, you, you have them go to their room, and you have them wait, and that's not just for their benefit, that's for your benefit. So you make sure that you don't discipline in anger. You're always measured and calm. The judge in the courtroom, the officer that pulls you over after you're speeding, they don't yell and scream. They're very calm, very measured. Why? They know they have the authority. They know they have the authority. When you have to begin to yell and scream at your children, you've lost your authority. They know they have the authority and you follow through on what you say. Firm, loving discipline keeps order in your home. Children will behave better if they have a schedule. Get up at this time. Eat at this time. Go to nap time at this time. Go to bed at this time. Don't just let them fall asleep whenever they fall asleep. Get up whenever they wake up. Put them on a schedule. They will behave better if they are. There's security in a schedule. I'm trying to help you. Chaos rules the house when kids are in charge. Oh, I don't know what to do. I just need a break. Get me out of here for a I need some time away from these kids. I, in the 60s, in the 50s, you never heard a mother say that. You know who says that? Kids who are not disciplined. And they're, the inmates are running the asylum. You make the, you, you establish the boundaries, you establish the consequences for the boundaries, and then you enforce them. It's pretty simple. Then they have a choice to make, don't they? If they want to disobey and cross the boundary, they know what's coming. Don't be consistent. Don't, don't, not, it, one day it can't be wrong and another day everybody laughs at it. You've got to be consistent. You'll be glad if you did. You'd be glad if you will be consistent. Children must suffer the consequences of bad choices. It's life. The Bible says a child left to himself will bring his mother to shame. I don't know about you. I don't know who those kids are that you see on the television that are rioting and breaking windows and starting fires and, and, and throwing temper tantrums. But if I was their mom and dad, I'd be ashamed. I'd be ashamed that that's my kid. Now, let me help you. Every family has problems. Don't, don't ever look at some family and think, boy, I wish we were like them. No, they got problems too. 
Everybody has problems. Don't, don't think, oh, we got problems. We can't, this is it. Let's just get rid of this. No, 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 no. Listen, if, if people divorced because of problems, everybody in the room would be divorced because everybody has problems. That's not a cause to split the family up. It's a matter of how you're going to respond to the problem. How are you going to handle the problem? I don't know Chinese, but I understand in the Chinese language, they don't have letters, they have symbols. And the, the symbol for crisis can also mean opportunity. Same symbol, but depending on the context, it means crisis or opportunity. So while one family has a problem and they see it as a crisis, some other family may have the same problem and they see it as an opportunity. How do you look at your problems? What do you see? God gives His best presence to His children and oftentimes they're wrapped in problems. The bigger the problem, the bigger the present, if you're willing to open it, if you're willing to unwrap it. How you respond to your problems will make you or break you. Learn as a family to attack the problem, not attack each other. So often, husbands and wives, they have, they, we got a problem. You know what they start doing? Attacking each other. Instead of saying, we're together. We're in this together. We are in this till death do us part. So here's the problem. Let's go after it together. Let's do it together. Little, some little boys were camping out in the backyard in a tent. The window was open and dad was overhearing their conversation. And one of the little boys said, my daddy knows the mayor. The other boys thought that was pretty cool. The other little boy chimed up and said, well, uh, my daddy knows the governor. And they thought that was pretty big. But then he said he heard the voice of his own little boy speak up. And he said, that's nothing. My dad knows God. And the other boy said, no, he doesn't. That's not true. And the boy said, yeah, it is. I heard him talking to him this morning. <laughs> is there anything greater than for your children to be able to say, my dad, my mom knows God. I heard him talking to him this morning. No greater than that. May God... Help us to be like Joshua and to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you for Joshua. Thank you, God, for his leadership. Thank you for allowing this conversation he had with the people of Israel to be recorded for us so we could look at it today and receive help from it. Lord, our world today is not any different than the world Joshua was in. In much ways, I think it's probably worse than the world Joshua was in. But we still would desire to rise up as he did and to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We understand that means that the men are going to have to be the leader. We're going to model Christ to our wives and God to our children. That mom and dad are going to set the moral example in the home. That it won't be do as we say, it'll be do as we do. Follow us as we follow Christ. Our children will be disciplined because we love them. I want them to know that we care enough about them that we want them to do what's right. Father, I pray there'll be many families here today, many dads here today that would make the statement, get on their knees before God and tell you that as for me and my house, 
we will serve the Lord. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a minute. I wonder how many folks here this morning would say, Preacher, the Lord spoke to my heart today. And by the way, whether you're a man in the home, the husband, whether you're a single mom at home, or a single dad at home, whether you're by yourself at home, you can still make this decision. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I wonder how many folks would say, Preacher, the Spirit of God stopped at my seat today. And I, from my heart, want to tell God, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Preacher, the Lord spoke to my heart today. Will you put your hand up? Christian, will you do it? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may put it down. Yeah, it's good for grandparents too, isn't it? Sure is. In a moment I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. If the Lord has spoken to your heart, the altar's open for you to use it. If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, when others come to pray, just slip out from your seat, come down front and uh, take my hand and say, I'd like to know for sure that when I die I'll go to heaven. If you're saved and never been baptized, and you ought to come and say, you know, I, I want to be scripturally baptized. Just need to come and pray and bow the knee. A husband, a wife, dad, and just come. Just take your wife by the hand and say, let's pray. And just kneel together and say, as for me and my house, we want to serve the Lord. Help me, God, to be the man I need to be at home. And God will help you. Father, thank you for speaking to hearts this morning. I pray your will will be done now these next few moments that before we leave this place, we humbly bow in your presence and ask for your help. Thank you for speaking to our hearts today. Help us to live the Bible we've learned. Bless this invitation. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, Lisa's going to play. She plays the invitation hymn, God has spoken to your heart. You come and respond to him this morning, will you? That's right. That's right. Amen.
Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer now. We thank you, Lord, for meeting with us today. It, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And Lord, thank you for each one that's made their way here today. And Lord, we go now from this place and ask you to uh, help us to keep the words in our heart. Lord, don't let Satan come and snatch it away. But as the seed has been sown in our heart, Lord, I pray it will find good ground and bring forth fruit in our lives. Give us safety as we go out and prepare us, Lord, for the service as we return this evening. Make us mindful that you're with us throughout the day. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing the joy of the Lord is my strength. And uh, that will be our closing song this morning. All right. Let's hear you sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. We'll see you tonight. Give me a minute to get to the back door. Please.